Okay, and we should be live now. So uh, for any of you who have tuned in for the stream, sorry we're starting up a minute or two late. We uh, just had some, some issues with the, the Hangout app here. So welcome, everyone. I've got some folks uh, in the Hangout here, and hopefully some others will be joining us. So we should have uh, 10 people on the, the panel here, so to speak. And uh, we'll explain more about that as we move forward. This has to do with some of the focus area leads that we talked about last time. Um, I guess if, uh, if folks don't mind, I'm going to start with a little bit of an intro and a review of kind of what we talked about last time and kind of set the stage here. So this is to discuss the possibility of developing a myoelectric uh, prosthesis, prosthesis model uh, within the Enable community, which would, of course, be open source. And, um, you know, part of the discussion today is just to sort of regroup now that we've all had a chance to think about possibilities and, and, and really, first up, I think, talk about does this still make sense? Do we want to still proceed down this path? Um, does this seem, you know, realistic, viable, etc.? Um, so uh, I, we'll have that discussion. Uh, last time, one of the things that we talked about was, um, which which led to this meeting, is this, this is a bit of an experiment. I'm trying to take a little bit more of a, a coordinated approach on this, sort of using some project management principles. Uh, have a project plan, have some assigned roles and responsibilities. Um, I want to balance that with, of course, the the qualities that make Enable so much fun. You know, it's a very loose, uh, open community. People are able to contribute freely. And I absolutely want to maintain that. Um, so, uh, oh, hold on, I'm getting a request for a re-invite. Let me just do that real quick here. Um, so I want to try to balance those two and do this in a way where I have some people who can uh, help provide central points of coordination, provide status updates, etc. but at the same time still allow that open and free exchange and allow people to contribute however they like. So I do want to make that very clear. Anyone is, is open and encouraged to participate in this. I do hope anyone interested will take part, whether or not you happen to be in one of these lead roles. Those are strictly people helping to coordinate communications, and uh, so we'll talk more about that. But everyone is welcome in any part of this project. Uh, having said that, I'm going to go ahead and, and pull up and share here a uh, uh, little more detailed version of the agenda. So hopefully you guys are seeing that now, and if you'd like to, you can click on my icon down below for those of you who are in the Hangout to keep that uh, frozen on screen. So uh, just, uh, uh, and this is, I'm sorry, I just got that. Here's the agenda. So uh, objectives for today's meeting, I, I think primarily, like I said, uh, we should talk about does it make sense to kill the project? Um, I hope the answer is no, but it, it always makes sense to at least have that discussion up front before we get too far in, uh, and, and I, I use that terminology just because I, it's, it's like, let's, let's try to kill it. Let's try to come up with a reason not to do mm -hmm. it. And if we can't, then that's a great reason to move forward. It, it sort of helps to validate our, our approach. So we should talk a little bit about that. Um, assuming that we get past that, that uh, discussion, then I think it's a matter of really clarifying the target population. Um, I, I apologize. I don't recall. I think it might have been Adam. I, I don't recall who brought that to the table, but I agree it's very important to understand clearly who are we trying to address with this design, and that's going to help us to uh, sort of clarify some of the parameters, which would be a, another important topic for today. Just sort of rough uh, parameters or, or rough guidelines of what is the kind of device we're shooting for, some of the, the you know, sort of boundaries of, of our design, uh, at least in that first phase. Uh, so then we'll move on to uh, reviewing, uh, I think I've already covered this, reviewing some of the first meeting and, and current status. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And then uh, move on to some, some more detailed discussion from there. So before I move on with the agenda, I just want to ask, I know some, a lot of people here weren't in the, the first meeting. The first meeting was really a pretty general discussion, just kind of talking about how we might approach this. And we, brought, we got into a discussion of what the focus area is might be that make up this project, and I've, uh, I've got those listed here, and we'll go through those in a moment. Um, but otherwise, does anyone have any, any sort of preliminary questions or any comments you wanted to make from that first meeting before we get going? Actually, Jeremy, real quick, can you, is, is it possible to share that document separately? The resolution, at least for me, the resolution is insufficient to see the, uh, the actual agenda items. Uh, absolutely. So how, how would be the best way to do that? I shared the link there. Um, oh, so I'm sorry. I'm, I did not... Uh, shared notes, is that the document you're referring to? That's correct. No, I can All right, my mistake. No, that'll be fine. I can just also zoom in here on my end. Maybe that'll help. So um, I'll keep it on screen, but you guys are certainly able to uh, to access this directly. If, if there's any watching the stream that don't have that link, um, it's in the shared enable folder under research and development, myoelectric prosthesis, and you'll see a document there called Hangout 2. Um, uh, notes. So feel free to jump in and, and follow along. 
So uh, any other comments or things from meeting one before we move on to agenda number three? Okay. So number three I have on the agenda is really just a quick review of what we talked about with these focus areas. Um, if we move forward with this, which we'll talk about momentarily, uh, we talked about these different focus areas that might make sense. And I'm, I'm intentionally going to go forward through a couple of these agenda items before we go back to the should we kill the project discussion, because I think it'll help to provide context for the people that, that weren't in the first call. So we talked about these areas, 3D printed parts in terms of designing those parts. And we have uh, Laird Popkin potentially taking lead there. 3D printed parts in terms of fabrication. We have Mark Petrakowski taking lead there actuators and mechanics in terms of motors or CO2 activation or anything else we might explore. Bob Roth is taking the lead for us there. Bo uh, board development, uh, Arduino and other such uh, programming related matters. Uh, Red Prado is agreed to step up there. EMG sensors or signal pickups, Trouble Stern. Documentation, big thanks to Artie Moskowitz who did agree to help us out there. I didn't have a lot of takers on that one. So Artie Shocking. Is, is willing to help us. Uh, regulatory and legal considerations. Adam, I'd love to have your help and input there and guidance, um, as well as sizing and customization methodology. And then sensory feedback, which might be a future phase in terms of you know getting haptic feedback and that kind of stuff. Trouble Storm has, has some interest there. Um, so that's sort of just from some uh, you know email and, and Google Plus messaging. Uh, that's kind of what we came up with since the last call. Does anybody have any uh, suggestions of like we're missing key focus areas or you know, maybe somebody else wants to, you know, really wanted to take a lead in some area. Anything that you want to talk about on those right now? For uh, here's, at least for my part, for the fabrication part of it, are we thinking? Oh, go ahead, Bob. Uh, I was wondering, do we have enough knowledge of myoelectrics to actually be able to successfully pull this off? Uh, our knowledge, as I mean, collective knowledge. Thank you, Bob. That's a great question. I think that's worth that's worth talking about. So, I think we're going to need to harass Jorge some about that. Um, he's he apparently did some research with phonomyography, which is a related field and has a lot of the same um, signal processing involved. And we might actually want to use phonomyography instead of uh, actual myoelectric sensors depending on what we learn about all that but making a myoelectric sensor that can pick up the signals is reasonably doable I mean it's an amplifier and some electrodes that can sense on the skin well and the real trick is all that signal processing stuff so if I you think oh, sorry, go ahead. Jorge might have that knowledge well if I, I mean we can uh... That I think the problem we're going to have is we can go down a, a rabbit hole of extensive discussion on any one of these things. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. uh, e EMG is something I spent a lot of time on. And uh, the, the, the quick answer is, I think, the answer, the, the quick answer is we have the skill set collectively within the community of people who have done enough and done enough research that I think we'll be able to pull it off uh, if it's a direction we choose to go. Uh, uh, in essence, what Nick is saying is it's really not that tricky, and um, there's 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 good and there's bad, but but at the end of the day, um, functional performance is not is not unachievable. That's pretty much all we can say at this point. So I don't, um, but we're getting I think into the should we kill the project side. So I don't know if that's a good place to be yet, or if we want to come back to that, or. Yeah, how about this? The next item that I had up on the agenda was just, let me do a different screen share here, just to show the preliminary project plan that I put together. And uh, I just think that might help to paint the picture a little bit and provide a context on what we're talking about doing. And then we can get into that discussion of how we feel about this. Uh, so I'm not going to go through all of this in detail here, but just a traditional project planning Gantt chart. And I've tried to lay out the high level phases of this. Uh, starting with planning and preparation, which we've already been well into from our, our last meeting. Uh, next, we would move into this sort of uh, exploration phase, which I would say we're already in, exploring various options, source designs, different techniques we could use, etc. And that information is already being gathered. After that, we would move into the design and testing phase, which is where those focus areas really come into play, where we can start to 
branch off and, and develop and then share our results in each of those areas. And I have that particular, oh, sorry, scrolling around here is a little sensitive. I'm trying to scroll over to the right to show you the, the timeline. Uh, anyway, the, uh, I, won't, I won't worry about that here, but the design and testing components I have stretched out as a longer phase here. In fact, what I can do is I'll, I'll move this over so you can see the dates. There we go. So, you know, as we move into that May, and I have it currently like May through September, so I've got a, a multi-month stretch there for the design and testing, and all of these dates and everything are, of course, up for grabs entirely. I just had to start with something. Then documentation, which of course I would hope is going to sort of be happening as we go, but I put it a little bit more uh, sequentially here. So we'd have a, really a, a couple of months for the various types of documentation between the docs themselves and video tutorials. That's not all going to come out together overnight, but I did want to capture that in the plan. And then we have kind of a release phase where we're publishing the Thingiverse, we're, we're putting the word out there, maybe even a press release and media events, stuff like that. And that would be kind of as we're getting to the end of the year and then moving into 2015 as the timeline currently sits. So just as a preliminary first brush project plan, I kind of laid this out as something that would span, uh, you know, what is that, about uh, you know, nine, maybe the next nine months or so. Uh, and that's completely open for discussion and modification. Uh, but again, just for the purposes of this next discussion, um, that's kind of what I was looking at in terms of the possible scale of this thing. So I think it's probably an appropriate time then to go ahead and jump back to that question of, does it make sense to proceed? Does this seem like a project worth taking on? You know, we all have limited time and energy, uh, so we want to make sure that we're placing that where it can have the most impact. So um, I, I want to just open that up for discussion now in terms of how you guys feel about proceeding with this project. I would, I would rather support a um, an effort to develop a myoelectric sensor more than a um, more than a electric hand. Essentially, I think the designs for electric hands are out there. I mean, that one we saw from Minmove is pretty fantastic, and I'm sure there's several others out there. I think the real gap in cheap open source stuff is the sensing side of things and doing more than a simple flex one muscle and do gross grip. Um, so I'm gonna, oh, go ahead, Bob. Sorry. Uh, how, many, how many sensors can a person use functionally, realistically, to uh, drive a bioelectric hand? So typically, um, so in your typical transradial patient, so uh, lower lower arm amputee, um, you've got uh, basically your flexors and extensors. Everything else is in effect lost. So that's that's where um, the um, you end up running into a lot of overkill on, and this gets to kind of what Nick was saying. Uh, adding a lot of extra fingers. Uh, is uh, great PR, but it doesn't necessarily get you a lot because fundamentally you only have two things you can control with, and so there are complexities. You can say, okay, well, if I give a flex command, then you do one different thing. So maybe you program it with your cell phone so you can change that state. Um, but fundamentally, you've really only got a few things you can do, and so that gets back to what Nick was saying, which is... Um, uh, you know, yeah, there's a lot of, there are these systems out there that can do lots of twiddly finger stuff, but they don't really get you that far until you've got a brand new way of controlling them, and those are still genuine, like, like university R&D type things. Um, but getting back to what Nick was saying, um, I'm not as impressed with the open source items that are out there. Um, the, uh, the reason that commercial products look like they do is because they're extremely robust and resilient. Um, and you can't change the fact that it, those systems, as simple as they are, still cost thirty, fifty, seventy thousand um, dollars even even if you just use a sensor speed hand, uh, you're looking at thirty k plus. So, uh, and where does that come from? Frankly, uh, there's a side note, but frankly, a lot of it comes from some of the outside economics. So, um, so I'm not saying it's the right thing to do, this, this project, but, but I don't know. I, I think there is a place for 
a myoelectric prosthesis that addresses uh, a community that, that currently doesn't have access. Um, I'll say my concern is primarily a dilution one. We have probably what I would guess, just looking at the names and looking at the posts that come through on the Enable uh, community, I'd say we probably have every single heavy hitter and serious committed person for, for the Enable community, or, or almost all of them, uh, on the horn right now. If this project goes forward, does that <laughs> suck every last bit of air out of what has historically been the path? That, that's my concern. Um, can I, I weigh in? Oh. Please. Uh, and you can hear me all right? Mm-hmm. All right. Sorry about that. Um, so a couple of things. Um, just to put on the table, a myoelectric hand for many of our clients might be uh, regressive. These are kids um, or adults who are well off using muscle movement to actuate the hand. And replacing that with motors might be a mistake. Now, that, that just argues for getting clear about who we're trying to treat and so on. Um, the second point I wanted to make is uh, to pick up on Adams. Uh, on the one hand, I do share his concern. On the other hand, you know, we're all in this because it feeds us in many ways. And if being at the cutting edge is one of the things that gets us up in the morning, um, and without sort of killing the other activities, that's really important. Um, but a third point um, related to those two is that I think that there may be some ways of designing this myoelectric hand project in a modular fashion that will be more robust and also deliver value incrementally as we go. And for example, uh, as we look at the available hand, uh, designs for robo arms, the whole question of wrist rotation is a real challenge to figure out how to do mechanically. I could imagine, for example, that we have a group that's working on, let's just try to identify a good motor and then see if we can't deal with, I would propose, wrist rotation and thumb rotation as the first two things we tackle. And those would be immediately useful add-ons to the hands that we're already dealing with and would keep people, instead of having them off in, a, in an isolated skunk works, it would continually push us towards reintegration into what you might call our current core competency. So those are my three first points about killing versus reshaping the project. Thank you. Very helpful. So we've had a couple of... To continue on your point, John, which I think is a very valid point, I think it might be wise for us to consider the possibility of using a combination of mechanical and myoelectric techniques so that we get the, po so we get the best of all worlds. So we could just use an a myoelectric function to, to operate peripheral to the mechanical function. I agree with that. So something I'd, uh, I'd thrown out before, and, and, uh, and this may fit into what John was talking about, was, and I think this is probably the, uh, a nice little baby step, is... Um, and I don't even know that this has to be a myoelectric. I mean, maybe we just begin by referring to it as a, as a powered concept. But basically just using some mechanism for amplifying the power. I, I seem to recall, and I don't know how often this is the case, but I seem to recall uh, a request for a, a subject from a, from a person who uh, wasn't, uh, didn't have enough strength to actually uh, execute substantial grip through the, uh, through the wrist flexion extension. So perhaps we simply go as a first step. We look at a a powered um, augment to an existing system. Nice. And so if we look at it in that context, it gives us the freedom to navigate in a lot of ways. We can use Maya, but we aren't obligated to. I mean, Maya will give you the same data as in that context as just about anything else. I think uh, because you can't. The myoelectric signals that induce flexion and extension in an enable hand are going to be the same commands that are going to give you anything else, right? So right. you can't you can't isolate those. So 
so in that context, maybe maybe what we look at as a starting point, just to get ourselves comfortable with working with motors and batteries and some sort of signal thing, is we just say, all right, we're gonna we're gonna give some of these, give an option to these hands to give it a little extra oomph. Um, and we may find that that is a very natural first step towards a myoelectric implementation, and we may find it a dead end, but either way, there may be some people who can help. Yeah, um, another big bonus of what Adam just suggested, um, in one of our previous calls, Adam mentioned that one of the biggest liabilities with real prosthetics that, you know, worry about liabilities, is that you might grip something and then not let go when you really need to. We were talking about bikes, like you might not let go of the handlebars when you really need to get off the bike. And in a situation where you're only augmenting, you can simply make your augment less powerful than the uh, than the existing strength, so that in a worst case scenario, they can still fight it and release the hand. So, say you make it three quarters as strong as their actual wrist motion, then they get 175% of the grip strength, but they still have full control to release when they want to, regardless of any bugs. Yeah, and we're definitely going to have to do some testing with that. I think somebody else mentioned before, though, that you know, at the end of the day, we're hopefully going to produce a design that is, is producible by the broadest range of people possible, which would mean probably 3D printed, which means we're probably still talking about a plastic design primarily. Mm -hmm. and so I, it's probably going to be sort of a breakaway design. You know, If something serious happened, it's, it's probably going to go to pieces, but right. something that we'll certainly have to test uh, to make sure that it can't get stuck like that. So it, it sounds like, I think I'm hearing a, a sort of a consensus on the idea of maybe we, maybe we should scale back and not focus on doing a full-blown biohand. We should instead focus on augmenting existing mechanical designs to bring a powered mechanism for wrist rotation and thumb positional adjustment. And, and that certainly doesn't take away from our ability to proceed into a full myo design later, but that, that seems like it gives a nice uh, a cleaner and more achievable definition, and uh, I like the sound of that. So I'd, I'd be open to any other comments, but uh, so far it sounds like we might want to proceed on that basis, that we're, we want to explore, uh, like Nick said, sort of start exploring the sensor options, whether or not we use those in this first phase. It might just be powered by a, a switch or something, but um, I think it's still worth exploring sensor capabilities. But otherwise, I think looking into existing designs and kind of like the augmented with uh, existing thumb rotation options. So, uh, any any disagreements on that, or does that seem like a good basis for proceeding? No, I think it's lovely. I think it's. Uh, I appreciate the uh, um, the strategy. One addition to that is, in addition to the notion that. So there's a flow chart, and there are triggers which could be myo, but they could also be. Um, mechanical sensors for the sensory augmentation um, and they could also be other sensors for example I'm very fond of this notion that um, you could have a mechanical sensor even a micro switch or something that detects pressure on the palm and that causes the hand to grip which is what our nervous systems do um, or something that notes pressure on the side of your forefinger, the outside of your forefinger, which causes the thumb then to move into a hold keys position. Um, so, the, so the point is, once we break it up this way, then we can think about specific near-term use cases, power augment or automatic handlebar grip or key grasp, and then explore various ways of triggering it as well as various ways of actuating it and we're adding what the user would recognize as functionality so as we go uh, Bob maybe you could uh, mute there we're hearing it go ahead John well I uh, that was my point Great, right. thank you very much. So I, I captured that in the notes, um, and and, that, and that's I, I agree completely with the uh, the use cases. We'll have I'm not going to try to do that. I, I I don't fit in the call here, but that sounds like a great follow up uh, action item for us to work on is is defining some very specific use cases, and then that'll feed back into uh, defining our our next steps. 
So I think uh, we have a, a consensus on, on not killing the project, but certainly modifying our, our objectives, and that, that uh, I don't know, it certainly helps me feel more comfortable with it, and hopefully the rest of you agree. So moving on, I think, to clarifying the target population, and John touched on a little bit of this there. Um, I, I think the group as a whole has always had a special place in our collective hearts for the children, and I, I would assume that that's still the case here. Um, but I don't know that we want to limit it to that. So any, any thoughts or comments on who are we trying, who, who do we want this to be applicable for? I have, an, I have a thought on that, just an idea. It would seem to me that a more complex function would be better used by an older person, more of an adult person, as we're, uh, I think it might be, unwise to apply this much complication to a hand for a young child. Agreed. Thank you. I would um, disagree with that. Oh, go ahead, please. Um, I know I haven't said much in here, but I was just kind of thinking about everything and what everyone says, but when we really think about the young mind of the children of that, especially for us, that we've, we've worked with about 10 to 12 different children, um, granted not an older person would be, would utilize maybe the complexity more of that, but a young mind has is still growing and is still fasting like that, and we'd be able to find different ways of using the mechanisms that you would that an older person would use, but would use them for a different things. So I would say I would keep our range still the same of using it for every children that would benefit from it, but I wouldn't say let's limit it to just older people or just younger people. I'd say we should just keep the range of everyone. I take your point. Uh, again, playing the role, uh, playing the role of user advocate, we have um, a surprising number of people who've reached out to us saying this project sounds great and then it turns out the kid, like Grace, doesn't have a wrist. Mm -hmm. um, and we're looking at the robo arm design and we're looking at Nick's design and I think all of us have the feeling that we don't have a solution yet um, fully. And I think that one of the challenges there has to do with the wrist rotation problem. If you, if, if you think about it, um, positioning the hand while you're bending your elbow in order to cause the thing to contract becomes an issue. Um, and so it's possible that that's telling us that first of all there's a real need for a robo arm, that a strictly mechanical robo arm may be an unsolvable problem. And so that could be a sweet spot for adding motors and even perhaps for the myoelectric part, because I could imagine that there are some muscles on the shoulder that could be engaged for the purpose of uh, triggering rotation without the much more complicated task of imagining that we're going to trigger um, all sorts of other finger movements. Great point. Thanks, John. Along with the along with the shoulder component of it, um, I would say let's steer away from any kind of shoulder harness if possible. Um, I've known multiple parents that have talked to me about any kind of mechanical hand or even um, old enough children to talk about it, saying that it, it is they would much rather not use any kind of hand whatsoever um, compared to something with a shoulder harness. Because one, it, you know, it's something that makes them stand out significantly a lot more. And then two, it's just a pain in the rear end to hook up every single morning, take off mm -hmm. every single night, you know, the whole thing. It's we got to make sure this is something easy that someone can just put right on and get ready to use it within a couple of seconds. Or, you know, just something super simple. And then having to put this whole huge hard harness on the whole shoulder and making everything right. I'm not saying that it's something that we can't necessarily do, but I'd say it's something that we need to be careful of and not get to that point of using that. Right. Okay. So um, back in terms of clarifying the target population, I mean, so far it sounds like the what I'm hearing is that we want to keep the the, the the sort of age range target fairly broad, ideally, but the, the focus is more I guess the people that are not being well served by the existing mechanical designs, like John said, people that don't have a wrist or for some other reason those simply aren't sufficient. Um, and so maybe focusing on the arm-based designs, which we do seem to be getting a lot of inquiries on, uh, and I'd love to have an enable you know, design to answer that with. 
maybe that's a good place to focus on these powered augmentations, which could, of course, then be incorporated back into hand-based design. Right. Could we have we have a list of instead of instead of keeping people who aren't can we just do a list of people who would benefit from the design more? Um, I know that I mean there might be some older people who would benefit from an all mechanical hand than having part of a mechanical by electric hand. Um, so if we could get something with like an activities list or like that of what the person would actually use the hand for and kind of stuff like that, then we can kind of. Be like, okay, this would fall more into the psych work hand or the talent piece hand, you know, something with the whole mechanical part of it. Or if they're going to do something more intrinsic kind of activities like that that would need some of the myoelectric or the myomechanical part of it, then we could do that end uh, for that hand. So I, I would say, yeah. I'd say just figure out if it would benefit more than using the mechanical hand or something like that. That's my forte on it. That's a good point. That, that kind of goes back to what John was saying earlier about defining specific use cases, uh, which I agree with. I, I think. That's probably going to be something we'll we'll sort of work on as a follow up to this call, um, because that, that could easily consume the rest of our discussion here. But let's let's work on that in terms of documenting some specific cases, and we can use those to determine where the biggest impact is going to be, and, and sort of focus our direction from there. Uh, I I can just give a quick sketch of where that might go. It's uh, it's sort of become obvious to me that you can use the geometry of the arm to say, okay, you've got people who've got um, a palm but no fingers. You have people who've got no palm. You've got people who have no wrist but a forearm. You have people with no forearm. And then you may have people with no upper arm. And actually, each of those, those are sort of natural cases. And I have the sense that they're biologically on a continuum as well. Um, I was at a, con at, a, at a meeting today that also talked about, um, I think it was muscular dystrophy and or no, uh, multiple sclerosis. There are people who have got the, the anatomy, but they don't have g grip strength. Um, we have one of those. And power assist is of interest there. So that could be, you know, in addition to the linear dimension of where, in the, where does the arm leave out, there might also be a dimension of um, strength. And then to that space, you could then attack, attach syndrome names. And you actually might come up with an interesting taxonomy of potential beneficiaries. Excellent. Capturing that here in our notes. Thank you. So just to so we'll continue to we'll continue to build on that and and maybe expand the details on those. But that gives us a great sort of guidelines for those use cases. Thank you. Yeah, and just to toss some vocabulary into our notes, I think that what Adam was saying, trans radial cases like Grace and Tully's, are probably the balance between easy for us to do with myoelectric stuff and uh, hard for us to do with chemical stuff, that kind of makes them the prime target for this. And uh, I didn't catch that. What was the term again? Trans Transradial. It's the radius bone in your forearm, so a nub between here and here. So is that is that the full term, transradial candidates, or tra how do you say that? Uh, so it'd be a it'd be a transradial amputee uh, or a transradial. No, I don't know. We always said patients, but I know that's not not desired in this community. I apologize. Um, so that basically you've got uh, just you've got uh, in in the prosthetic community you refer to partial hands, which is anything that is um, more distal than the next one, which is wrist disarticulation. A wrist disarticulation means that the amputation or the trauma induced separation at the wrist. Then you have transradial. Presumably, there's an elbow disarticulation. I've never seen that. And then you've got transhumeral, which is upper upper arm. So an upper arm would be one that requires an elbow. That'd be transhumeral. Transradial is someone who has a residual limb. By the way, that's the that's the term that's preferred uh, to nub or stump or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, I was wondering. Of, yeah, you you refer to the residual <laughs> limb or or residuum. Um, so you have a residual limb. Those are of varying lengths, and so you don't know how much space you have to put things in, mm -hmm. uh, and then you go from there. So, sorry, just some quick no, that's, that's very helpful. Thanks for the education. Adam, do you happen to have some kind of a, a uh, good web link or a PDF on that, point. Group that, that kind of covers those concepts? Uh, I don't, but I can probably gin something up pretty, pretty, pretty quick. I can put it on my to-do list. Oh, that would be awesome. Thank you. And Bob, go ahead, please. Uh, one of the 
the, when I was originally came up with the idea of wanting to do uh, a, above the I wanted to do a transhumeral. And one of the reasons that I wanted to do that was because it gave me so much room in the exoskeleton of the forearm to mount all my my mechanics. I was it was my intention on my original design on my the concept that I was going to do was to provide a transhumeral swivel, an elbow hinge, and a uh, trans radius swivel, and then the closure of the hand which would be a total of four inputs, or four axes. Now, but then you have to open and close each axis. So that creates eight uh, mm. EMG sensors. Is that a fair assumption? Yeah, um, so normally the way that's done, so when you've got a transhumeral, or a transhumeral, basically you end up with the same thing. You've still only got two signals. Um, I don't know, Nick, I, Nick, I shouldn't have jumped in. Go ahead. Yeah, well, I was just going to say he said um, eight signals to control, four degrees of freedom. As I understand it, electro and phonomyography can sense the state of the muscle, not just the transitions. So the, the article I read said that there's a big peak when you first initialize mus muscle contraction, but then there's still, um, there's other vibrations from the resonant frequency of the muscle, I think, so correct me if I'm wrong, but you can tell that a muscle is currently flexed, and if you can do that, then I think you only need one muscle per degree of freedom, because you can just say, turn this degree of freedom if you have the muscle flexed, don't if it's not. Um, yeah, you can you, you can figure them separately. In effect, that's true. Uh, your level of signal attenuates, so basically you get a rapid rise you get a prolonged uh, high level of signal. This is primarily for EMG. Now, for for mechanomyo, just because that's I mean, that's not researched as much because it hasn't just hasn't panned out. I I don't know what it does. Um, but basically, you get a high peak, then you get kind of a level, and then you start tapering off after about ten seconds. But basically, you just sort of say, "Am I on or am I off?" The the problem is you still only have one on one off. So mm -hmm. generally, what happens Binary. is elbows. Well, not just that, but you've only you've still only got your biceps and triceps flexors and humerus. So basically, normally what will happen is you'll have a passive elbow. Um, you'll have uh, sometimes you'll control things via some other control scheme. So for instance, uh, you do this in transradials. You'll uh, you'll flex your wrist twice rapidly. It's like double clicking mm -hmm. sort of. And then that changes your state. And so after that, maybe you're rotating your wrist when you flex and extend, rather than opening and closing your hand. Does that make sense? Yeah. I... So you you can you can play games with that. But basically, the whole thing, the whole the whole problem with all of this is you're rapidly getting into some very non-intuitive mo movements. Mm -hmm. um, you're adding cognitive load to the to the person trying to use this. At the end of the day, what we I think we're we're probably getting adding a lot of challenge and complexity by getting there. Um, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. That's Well, I, I think sense. that's true. I, mean, I think that's the argument in favor of saying Mayo is the... I think, I, I think I disagree with Nick here. I think Mayo and the signal processing is the hardest part, and there's a reason it's the hardest part. Um, and I don't know that, if you will a bunch of amateurs like us are the best people to nail that problem. Um, I, I think it's an interesting thing to explore, and I think we should explore it, but I think that, for example, the key sensor and the palm sensor and the sensor that detects that there's pressure trying to grip, let's amplify it. Um, those are all unfilled niches that relate to underserved populations who aren't going to have expensive electronics. Um, and by the way, those are all cases that don't increase cognitive load, which is, by the way, the way our bodies work. So I'm, I'm very keen on sort of these natural triggers. So uh, I, I'm going to oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, John. Oh, I was going to say um, cognitive load is a short term. What about the possibility instead of, uh, or what, how about the. <laughs> sorry, Bob. Sorry, we got some lag going on. We got some lag going on. Trouble, why don't you go ahead first? All right. Um, I was going to say, cognitive load is a short-term problem. I've relearned new configurations for my hands like four or five different times just from surgical alteration. Um, there's a period of adjustment 
but your muscles, the, the nerves in your arm pick up the load of, of, of handling the new, the new uh, ways of moving that you have to pick up. It stops being something you have to think about after about three weeks of use, four weeks. It, it's kind of like learning a new keyboard layout. It doesn't, after the initial couple of weeks of adjustment, it stops being cognitive. Right. That's Sorry. that's true for some performances. Uh, what where it, where that's not true is when you start getting into, you got to do A and then B and then C. Mm -hmm. So if you've got to do this like double tap to do a wrist rotate, what ends up happening is people just never use their wrist rotator. Um, it, it just it's not attractive enough of a feature, and so instead they'll just shift their body around to get to the position they need to be in or they want to be in. So uh, right. you're absolutely right for certain. Certain, so time, you know, it's how, how much you're adding, basically. The time delay of doing the double click makes people less likely to use it because they want to get to doing the gripping quickly. Yeah, yeah, the, basically. The slowdown is the problem. So, I, and I think Bob was saying something too. Yeah, yeah Bob, sorry. You go ahead, Bob. Yourself, so uh, please go ahead. Oh, he dropped off. Okay. Uh, he, I think he had um, a pretty weak connection, so he might be. Yeah. Tired. Well, and and going back going back to John's point, I I, I agree and I disagree. Um, doing doing EMG basically is a very well worn path. Um, so uh, and, I mean, there's a lot of stuff on the level of technology, and frankly, that it is not basic EMG, and frankly, has that it is not basic EMG. Oh, I has an echo. Um, has a few trouble. Oh, trouble with getting a few. Uh, okay. Uh, basic EMG hasn't progressed uh, in that sense. I mean, now they're trying to add extra complexity, but I, I think it is certainly achievable if we choose to go that path. But I don't think I, I like where John what John is talking about. Um, so I, I'm seeing two different things personally. I'm seeing we do something that is fundamentally different from what currently exists, and I think that's kind of what John is arguing, which is basically. We identify niches that aren't met not only in our community but in the greater community. Um, the other side of the argument is we say, you know what, there is a tried and true path for people who have transradial amputations or, or whatever, and the problem isn't that the approach is bad, it's that the cost is bad. And so at that point what we're doing is we're saying we're going to execute with a primary focus of adding access by reducing cost. So I see those as not necessarily entirely conflicting, but as John's indicating, there's a substantial emphasis difference. I mean, we only have so many electrical people working. Are they working on, you know, your 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 uh, touch sensors, or are they working on EMG feedback and and recreating basically what currently exists from Autobach or somebody else. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not saying either one's good or bad, but, um, but I do think they are, that is a bifurcation point we should probably put our nickel down on. Excellent, thank you. And I, I think this is related, but um, I, I just, I've, I've let this go for a while. There is a question in the QA from Roe who was asking how many people have purchased and received sensors so far. There seems to be a shortage. Does anyone want to comment on, has anyone had success even getting any of these sort of test sensors, or have we even tried to do so? Um, I don't know where we're getting them from. I had a, I had a group of students who, uh, who are doing some stuff kind of like this. Uh, they, ordered it, they ordered a kit from SparkFun, which I think is the same kit we're talking about. I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. And it's coming in, it came in end of last week. I don't, and I think they showed some in stock right now. So They only um, sell one at a time. Oh, is um, that what it is? Well, they they only sell one design at a time, so it's okay. they had a previous version of the muscle sensor, but if they bought it in the last week, it's what we're looking at. Okay. I I I suspect that's going to change over time, and we're going to need some time to kind of get into the first parts of this anyway. So hopefully that won't hold things up too much, but we'll have to keep an eye on it. Well, um, just kind of looking through the other comments that have come in through QA. While we're on the subject of sensors, all right, go ahead, Bob. Uh, while we're on the subject of sensors, um, it's my understanding, I have a friend who's a pretty sharp uh, engineer, and he was saying there's other types of sensors, like pressure-sensitive sensors. Uh, they're not EMG sensors, 
uh, he said there's basically three different types, and I don't know which one is going to suit any our application or a combination of different sensors. Or uh, what I know about sensors, you could fit in a thimble. Great, good to have options. We'll certainly have to look at those and see what's going to. You know, I think a lot of this will be flushed out as we define those use cases that we talked about. Really clarify what we're trying to do. What are those niche areas where we think we can really have a big impact? And, and that's going to then lead us towards which of these specific technology options or methods are going to work best to achieve that. Um, so far, the comments that I'm seeing in Q&A seem to be certainly in favor and supporting the idea of sort of an augmented approach to mechanical design. So we, we continue to seem like we have an agreement there. Um, we've already, we, we've been kind of going through, in this discussion, we've touched on the next several agenda topics, which is great. So we're already getting into some of the initial phase one design parameters and, and all of that. Uh, I do have on the agenda also uh, a, a sort of discussing possible source designs to use as input. Uh, I don't think that's worth going too much into now because I do think it's worth clarifying a, a little bit more you know, outside of this meeting exactly what our objectives are, which components we want to design, and then we'll look at you know, where to pull from. But I do have the link in the agenda to the document where I have a whole list of possible source designs that we've been collecting. And do feel free to add to that list. You know, we've got the the, uh, the open hand project design in there, the in move stuff, a whole bunch of others that we can just look at and get ideas from, and and maybe even you know borrow things from if appropriate. So, Jeremy, can I can I just say one one I promise brief thing on that? Oh, please. Um, execute a. <laughs> you didn't have to laugh, Nick. Um, it's I think it's really <laughs> important to exercise caution on when evaluating. Uh, uh, reference designs that haven't been validated in the field. I mean, I think the uh, the the greatest I don't know if it's the greatest virtue, but the greatest strength of where we're at with the enable uh, classes family, whatever you want to call it, of hands is people are out there using them, beating on them, and uh, we you know the yeah it's great the the in move hand is impressive and and uh, it's articulated and does all these things, but it doesn't. The question is, does it solve the needs of Someone who needs what we're talking about, and so I'm, I'm probably overly pessimistic, uh, but I am indeed quite pessimistic about anything that hasn't been out of the lab as a reference design. It's it's great as a starting point, but if we want to be on a nine month time frame, that's not where we're at. We're looking at people who are well. I mean, we just got Peregrine popping up. Uh, people who are beaten on those uh, on those uh, enable hands day in and day out. That's a reference design I like. I, that's a great point, and thank you for bringing that up. I, I put that into the notes. I, I'm going to continue, and I, well, I, I encourage others to continue to just, you know, put any consideration, you know, sort of reference designs in that list, but you bring up a very important consideration as we're looking at each of those, that we should be very careful about what's been proven. So thanks for bringing that up. To go off of Adam's point, um, we've distributed, I, I want to say, about six different hands, and we have had yet to have anyone come back, and they're using it every single day, um, through activity like that, and we have yet for anyone to come back saying that they've broken any single part of the hand. So um, the Cyborg Beast hand that currently the files that I post like that, they're robust enough, and they're, we haven't seen anyone break it yet again that we're giving them to kids who are in the ages of, you know, 3 to about 17 now. And, but the problem is that, you know, even when, even that young age, you know, you remember you got to make the hand smaller, so... As small as the parts go, we still have yet to see a part really break yet. I'm not saying it would. Some. I'm not saying stuff won't break, but I know they're going to break at some point or another. But um, it's been about a week and a half, two weeks now, almost. I would say, um, and nothing has broken yet. So. Cool. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, I'm just sending out one other invitation. Um, so. As we move forward then, looking back at the agenda, we've got uh, a good starting discussion on design parameters, and we'll have to clarify some of those use cases and, and fine-tune this. I think what probably makes sense then in light of our discussion is to go back to our list of uh, focus areas. Let me go ahead and share my screen here again just uh, for this part of the discussion. So to go back to this part here where we have a list of uh, focus areas and uh, you know the folks that agreed to to take lead on those, I think that's probably going to need some modification now. Some of these probably are no longer relevant. So maybe we could talk a bit about this. What what would be the appropriate focus areas given this intention of, of uh, a powered augmentation of existing mechanical designs? Um, let's get some feedback on that. 
So my, my quick thought is that maybe we should aggregate these on the front end into just sort of mechanical and electrical or something like that in the interest of, um, you know, as we try and kind of collapse our space, you know, are we using myosensors or are we using something else, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, you know, I think anybody who's got an interest in the electrical side, uh, maybe they accumulate together and they become a subgroup until it until it subsequently diverges uh, as needed. But I don't know that's my thought. Okay, very helpful. Thank you. I'm just kind of splitting these up. Uh, I guess so. Under mechanical, we'd still have some kind of 3D printed parts design and fabrication that are related to these, even if there's powered components too. I'm guessing there's still going to be some kind of design and fabrication involved for the new mm -hmm. mechanisms for wrist rotation or thumb rotation. So I'll keep those in there. Um, under electrical, we still have you know possibly board development programming and EMG sensors. Uh, where would actuators and mechanics go? I guess uh, I guess that sort of fits under the mechanical side of things primarily, right? You say potato, I say potato. Basically, yeah, it could be both, really. Okay. <laughs> It's who Bob likes to play with the most, I think. <laughs> okay, um, documentation. Yeah, really both. Uh, certainly, that's the only thing I'm qualified to do. Listen, that doesn't stop the rest of us. That's right. <laughs> okay, so uh, I've got them organized now. So under mechanical, we've got 3D printed parts, design, and fabrication. <laughs> um, I've got I've got layered right now on on lead for design. Um, and I've got Mark on lead for fabrication. I believe the, the primary reasoning there, and please feel free to give me suggestions. This is just, you know, I don't know if I think I was thinking of Laird because he's been leading on some of these sort of efforts to uh, parameterize models. And, and I, I do want to end up with whatever we build being available in a parametric version. Uh, but I'm, I'm totally open to suggestions here. Does, does this seem like a, a good way to proceed, or do we have other suggestions? It looks good to me. Okay. Uh, and Artie, welcome. I'm sorry. I, I think I failed to get you an initial invitation. I'm glad you were able to join in. I'm, I'm sorry you missed the first part, but uh, we uh, we will have the recording available so that you can you can catch up. We are just talking about moving forward with a uh, a slightly modified plan instead of going towards a full blown myoelectric hand. We are moving towards a an augmented version of a mechanical hand where we incorporate powered or motorized versions of of something to to, to wrist rotation and thumb movement uh, and and that is as our next phase. So that's where we're at. We're talking about the different focus areas that make sense for that effort. Um, I'm wondering if I can uh, narrow this a little bit further. I first of all, I, um, Bob, mute that microphone. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I put up just a little schematic that allows me to make a point, which is that um, we can array many of our potential recipients in this two-dimensional space. And one of, the th one of the ways we can decide, we should, I think, decide which way we want to go is to see if we actually have a good partner, uh, a good client, analogous to Peregrine um, or Trouble, who would actually make use of this and would would be a collaborator with us? Um, so that was the, that was the second point I wanted to make. The third point I wanted to make was um, I don't know. We can ask Peregrine, but Peregrine, do you want more grip strength as an example? Um, I'm you see the always need for open power for assist. Grip I'm um, sorry. I'm not sure that I would necessarily use power assist for that. I'm mostly still looking at mechanical things. I think that if actually my idea is um, if we were if I were to use a sort of ouch power assistance, it would actually be using. Is he Some sort of myosensors yeah. yeah. to activate that kind of stuff. Peregrine's. Sorry, you had to cut out. We missed the um, important part of what you just said, okay. Peregrine. Um, for. Okay. Um. As far as like what the hand is being used for now, and grip strength and all that, I'm. So far, I'm still just looking at mechanical. Like the same mechanism we're using right now, just trying to perfect that. 
Mm. Um, if I were going to use any sort of Mayo activated thing, it would be more working to augment the Swiss Army hand idea, using perhaps Mayo sensors to activate right. that. Yeah. You know what, while we're on that subject, okay. so that the paragon is just I think I can get... Hmm? Go ahead. What was that? All right, I think he's saying go ahead to me, and I'm going to go ahead. Um, first of all, uh, Bob and Peregrine, some good advice would be to mute your video when you want to be heard. Um, the point I wanted to make is that Peregrine is one data point, but if Peregrine is typical, it's not clear that we have a partner who needs a power assist. I suspect, but I can't prove it, but I'm challenging us to prove it, that there are people who want the arm and that the arm requires some kind of a rotation. So I'm now putting forward the hypothesis so, that we should converge first on a rotary wrist for a robo arm and that just everything be started in that framework if we can find a client who agrees that they really, really want an arm. Why, why a wrist? Yeah. Um, why a wrist? Because my impression, and I think Nick probably is clearer about this than I am, but if you look at the few videos available of someone with a robo arm, they, huh, they're using their entire arm in order to produce the clenching, and it's even harder to imagine how they're going to get wrist rotation that way. So my sense is that, you know, we take for granted that we rotate our wrist to compensate for the bending of our arm. Those two things are conflated in a robo-arm design. My real point is not to say let's focus on the robo-arm, but to say let's adopt the discipline of finding a client who really needs something that we're trying to come up with, because the feedback will be invaluable. Yeah, but we can also fold that back the other way, the other context in that we look for a client. We, we define sort of our limits of a simpler problem we want to approach as a group, for instance, and we find a client that fits that. And maybe that's not the greatest population. I mean, maybe the greatest population is transradials in the developing world or something. But, uh, but we may say, you know what, that's a a lot to bite off at the beginning. Maybe what we do is we define a smaller problem up front uh, and we tackle uh, I, that, and then we and we build from there. I, I don't know, just a okay. No, no, actually, I think, I think I think we're convert. I think maybe we're converging on the notion that if at all possible, and Jeremy is in a really good position to help with this. Let's find a client who wants something we think we can deliver relatively easy, easily. Right on. <laughs> And Using then Mayo, that, that becomes our first case. Using Mayo for wrist rotation definitely makes me a client. It definitely buys into what I don't have. It's it's a big use for me. Um, well, that's interesting because you're you would then be a double duty collaborator because you're also a uh, a technologist. A technologist. Yeah, I have no rotation on my wrist. I have no flexion on my wrist. It's all in the fingers. Hmm. Uh, everything in my wrist has been fused, and I have no radius, so um, no rotation. Um, so that's really interesting. Uh, I'm again, a radio. Yeah, sorry. I, I have a radial club arm. That's that's the name of my deformity. And that's all right. You go ahead and talk. So my question on that is because maybe you're the case we were looking for. Uh, how do you imagine this thing working? Then it sounds like. I mean, do you want a robo hand on top of your existing hand that can that could rotate? It would lengthen your arm, but then it would. Um, yeah. It would grip and rotate. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking. Well, that's really interesting. That's really interesting. Could fit like this, that would um, 
give me a little extra length on my arm and would have something that would wrap around my fingers on this side that would give me whatever inputs to control fingers. Those could be mechanical, those could be strings going okay. to little paddles that my fingers are in my fingers are in. But I've also got muscles that I can get good signal from that don't change anything. They don't move anything. They stopped being of use when they fused my wrist. But I can I can I can get a lot of um, motion in those in those muscles, and um, if I could use that for rotation, and I've got more than one, so I could use for rotation in both directions. If I had that and some way of mechanically rec uh, receiving input from my fingers for motion of fingers, I could find uses for that. <clears throat> I, I, I really appreciate what you're saying. Um, it's really it's interesting. It sounds like you're looking for an orthotic assistive device, but the one mm. thing that I can see that would work well for your particular application, is, and tell me if I'm wrong on this, that we can actually use your fingers to operate this device. Yeah, using... Um, I mean, it could, we could try to find a way to track down all the finger motions myoelectrically, but I think bimetallic flex sensors or just buttons would be good enough, um, or switches controlled by finger motion, or we could leave finger control... Look, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Finger can control could, could be completely mechanical. It could just be... Um, Running wires it could be little tiny, a, little tiny, tiny micro switches. Could be that too, yeah. But so, it could just be the same way that uh, that that we're using the the palm plate to do mo uh, to to pull the fingers. Now we could do the same thing with a separate finger for each, a separate um, wire for each finger, similar to the original Ivan Owen um, costume hand where he did the big uh, cyber uh, cyborg hands when he right. first started this right. thing off. Right. Um, something similar to that that would be of use. Um, yeah. So I'm just one voice, um, and I'm yakking. But I would I would suggest, as a straw man, and it's already clear that Adam is perfectly comfortable disagreeing, so that's good. But I would propose that a straw man, and trouble is a perfect case because with trouble we could work on. Um, Wrist rotation and finger actual finger trigger finger triggering and myo triggering. It would solve some real problems, and the solutions we came up there would then become part of our bag of tricks for other cases. And it could, um, in, in his case, you would need. The power assist because he can't bend his wrist. You would need the rotation because he can't rotate. Um, and then we could, if Maya was a challenge, we would use fingers as initial triggers. And if Maya wasn't, we would then start coupling it to the natural muscles on his forearm, and seeing if we could get that to work. I'm just, uh, I'm just curious, Trouble. You've got, um, you've got flexion extension, right? No. Okay, so you've got so basically you've got, so you have I have finger resistance. yeah I have finger flexion okay I can, I can I can um I can pick up a coke can full of okay. coke with the fingers okay. and pressure against the palm but everything in the wrist is fused and okay. and and because of the club arm I have no rotation okay but if the um, rotation okay. wasn't fused um you would not. Basically, because of that fusion, you can't you can't have an external mechanical joint at that location either. Everything would have to be offset in some way. Some way. Right, but my arms side by side. Oh, okay. There's plenty of room to extend my arm and have a more normal looking arm. Um, my arm is uh, part of the reason they fused my joint is because we used an Elizarov's device to lengthen my arm. You know. Broke the bone in a couple of places, length, uh, straightened the arm out, and then lengthened it uh, with a wrench. Every day, I would crank the. They had a device on my arm, and I would crank it about a millimeter a day. And we can you can stretch broken bone like taffy if you do it 
with a with a with an Elizarov's device, and we added about five inches to the length of my arm, which significantly increased the tension in my um, in my tendons, and so the fusing the wrist was to keep my hand from being locked down. It makes my fingers um, you know kind of curled permanently, and I don't have a lot of strength to release them. But uh, um, you know another reason that something that I could wear that would um, I don't know, use elastics or something to hold my fingers straight would be of use is that would allow me to extend my fingers and I can't do that very effectively now. Um, so, so, so trouble, first of all, you have, have to mute, you have to mute your microphone. Yes. And anyone else speaks. Okay. Um, so Adam, I think what trouble is offering is that he would accept an artificial hand six right. inches beyond his existing hand, right. which addresses Mark's concern because it actually suggests that we could use a standard cyborg beast or other, you know, enable hand and just have a non-standard gauntlet that would wrap around his existing hand. Right. And so it, he's actually yeah. a really interesting test case for us to work with. Yeah, I, I mean, I would I would say that uh, so um, you know going kind of kind of working working with what Mark is saying, um, it seems to yeah, me very that, good point. Uh, it seems to me that we may be able to sort of have the uh, uh, I don't know if it's really the best of both worlds, but but we may be able to work with trouble. Uh, be able to do exactly what you're talking about by, and even just from a starting point, we don't even talk about the wrist rotation function, we just talk about basically powering an enable hand, period, right? So we just say we're going we're gonna to find a way, so instead of relying on wrist flexion, we're going to power it externally somehow. That's the prime concept, uh, context. Um, we have someone who's motivated to do it, uh, it was a great, you know, on board and, and, and sold with a program, right? And so, uh, you know, then we get to, are we, is the actuation mechanism A or B? Is it, is it, you know, basically we actuate it inside the gauntlet by, you know, squeezing the fingers back or forward and it becomes an amplification system? Or is it Mayo? It's kind of moot because that allows us to, structurally separate the development of our sensor system from the development of our mechanical system from the development of our uh, electrical system which is probably really good for a disparate you know geographically distributed group like this um, I think that's a really interesting thing I think Mark's point about it not necessarily being a, a broadly representative case is totally valid but I think as a stepping stone it is it gets us to a great place Without, while engaging our community that, as it already exists, um, I don't. Know, I think there's a lot of. I don't know that that is interesting to me. But Mark, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah. So, um, Bob, could you mute your mic real quick, please? Perfect. Um, yes, I'm back. No, I was I was asking if you can mute your mic because I was getting some feedback from yours. But um, kind of with my comment is that we have to think about this in the broad sense, you know, we're going to be making a hand for someone who, I mean, Trouble, you're, you're a very special case, and I'm not saying that you're the only one out there that's like that, but I don't think that the majority of people out there have the same kind of case like you do. I think that the way that we need to look at this is go with the majority of people, what they have like. I think the majority of people would have, um, even if they have just a stump with some wrist movement, I think we need to look at that because the majority of them do. Um, and even if it's some risk movement, it's not a lot of degrees, but it's still something that we can accommodate for. But then I'm saying at the same time, then, you know, we can also, once we get that generic model done and kind of how to make that work out and kind of use that as, because then we can have a lot, then we can be able to distribute that to some more people and have a lot more people give us feedback on that as well too. At the same time, if we get that generic model done, then we can do on the customization part of it and make you a hand that would work for um, your case specifically. because. I don't think, I think the hardest part is that the way how we were just talking about right now is if we're going to make something for Trouble right now, even though the Trouble is part of this our group right here like this and he's going to give us a lot of feedback right away, the problem is that if we make something for Trouble, how are we going to replicate Trouble's hand for the majority of people? It's oh, well, much harder. 
Well, it's, Mark, I'd, I'd actually roll back and say that um, that if what we're arguing is we're going to power an enable hand, if that's if that's basically what we say, we're going to we're going to just uh, we're going to we're going to remove the wrist flexion component. We're going to rely on an external motor, say, uh, or you know, as an augment. But either way, what we're saying is, in effect, we're planning on building a myoelectric transradial prosthesis, which is really, frankly. You know, correct me if I'm wrong, Trevor, but that's basically kind of where you're where you're at, right? I mean, that's I. I mean, you've got the extra digital control, but so what we're saying is that is that if we if we target him, there may be some difference in the control side of it, as in maybe we take advantage of. I, I feel really bad acting like you're not here, Trevor. My apologies, um, but I've, uh, you know maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe we rely on his digital control specific to his situation, but we can also, but but it it is a direct analog. Aside from maybe the controls aspect, it's a direct analog to a huge population of patients who are really who who are really very much in need in the same way of the community we're working with right now. What we're right. walking away from, kind of the counterpoint, I guess, to to what I'm saying is we're walking away from the pure powered augment of our current population of patients. As in, oh, you don't think so, John? I mean, well, I, I guess I, in I, my I, mind, I, I, you got to have enough real estate to do all this, and so you may be only in, in a prosthetic situation. Sorry, go ahead, John. Uh, I think maybe we can persuade Mark this way. Um, Mark, I think the trouble is our fastest path to the general device that you want because he's got he gives us more to work with um, he's got forearm that we can we can use he's willing anyway so, so that's the point is that if you were going to um, try to build this general case you would want a candidate who you could experiment with and who would offer some inter some interesting options Anyway, that, that's, that's my thought, is that this isn't trying to... The point of focusing on trouble is not to solve his problem because he's our friend. It's that he's actually a really good test pilot who offers some unique advantages like fingers that can be used as actuators but not used for, for a good working hand. And he's willing to stick a standard robo-hand onto his arm. Right, and I get that. I think... I think Kind of what I was trying to say, maybe came out the wrong way, and is um, from a design and fabrication standpoint, it's hard to go from a kind of com customization part that trouble that we would kind of use trouble to make some of that to something to a general population kind of model. It's it's in my case, it's it's more difficult to make something like that. Um, it's it would be more beneficial, I think, and I think it would be. Easy, I want to say easier, but more less time consuming to make something for the general population, get that going, and then we do the special comic kind of customization for each part of it. Now, Mark, I'm not saying, wh where do you see is the breakdown? Because I, th I think maybe maybe that's why we're talking past a little bit. Like, where where do you see where do you see the elements that are unique to Trouble's case? Because I, I personally I think I see more similarity than I do uniqueness. But maybe there's something I'm not seeing because I haven't been working with patients like you have. Right. I would say that um, the fused wrist is a big one like that because, I mean, a lot of the patients that we're working with obviously have a wrist so they can do the mechanical part of hand of it. And also the fingers. Um, with the finger design, then you have to make a palm that's bigger and kind of more and you fit the hands, the fingers like that as well too. But, um, like, with, I mean, even with our test case, you know, they still have a stump, but then they might have little small fingers on top, but they right. can't move those fingers. And I think so that's... So I think that's where we're breaking. I think that's where we're. Uh, where I think that's. I think you just hit the nail on the head. Um, I think what we're what we're kind of kicking around, and this doesn't mean it's the direction I think that that we end up going. But I think what we're kicking around is not um, is not a classic enabled hand that is wrist actuated and that we're doing a hand augment on, a power augment on. We are fundamentally talking about putting a robo hand on the end of a socket with some electronics in the front end and so it is a more classic transradial prosthesis I think this is what we're talking about, I'm not sure a more classically you would classify it as a transradial prosthesis not as a partial hand prosthesis and so the flexible hand, the fingers, all that stuff becomes unimportant because for purposes of you know, Trouble's case 
all this stuff is basically the first half of his socket. The second half becomes battery and motor and Ar Arduino or PSOC or whatever controller we use. And then up here, we happen to have a robo hand. That's our actuator. That's our terminal device. But it just happens to have a motor on it instead of using a wrist flexor uh, engagement system. So okay. I, think, I think where we were talking cross purposes, you were still thinking in terms of this operation, maybe? No, no. Kind of. Well, no, no. I think, I think, no, I think you've clarified a lot of it, of it, and I think that's something I probably kind of blanked on even asking. Is, are we talking about using the forearm muscles, or are we talking about using his fingers? Because I know that I know there was a part in the conversation that I was thinking of is that, oh, we're going to use the fingers to control some of the flexion, extension, kind of rotation of that. And the right. problem is that, that guys, because I want to jump in just real quickly if I could. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Mike, Mark, uh, but I, I, I got a little bit confused there myself because my impression was that we had sort of gone in an area where we're focusing on taking an existing enable hand, for example, the Cyborg Beast, mm -hmm. and augmenting it with powered components specifically towards wrist rotation and thumb positioning, um, and starting there. So when you describe... Uh, you know, when you say that you think what we're the path we're on is developing really a, a myoelectric transradial prosthesis with the electronic components and a socket and everything, uh, <laughs> I wasn't under the impression that we are going for that right now, at least. So I want to I, see if others are looking at it that way. Yeah, I and I want to be clear. That's not. I, I'm not necessarily advocating it. I'm just saying that's the context of I think the discussion we're having. If if we use trouble as our as our basically as our prototype case. I see. Um, okay. So I would like to personally, um, I'd like to roll back, and I'm not a big fan of the whole wrist rotation thumb. I think the simplest, personally, I think the simplest step is making this stronger. We can. That is probably our simplest first step, and our best option for finding out whether we're any good at this. And it's it's just basically people who can't do this real well, or that I should say, real well become better. So, so you make, I think that's a simple good case. point. That might very well be the most achievable and the easiest to approach. I think the other side of that discussion is what's going to have the most impact. What, where is the greatest need out there right now? And I think that's where uh, John and others were talking about focusing on the wrist rotation and thumb positioning because it would sort of allow completely different times, types of grasps than are currently possible. You're suggesting starting with the finger grasping mechanism uh, because it'll help us to, like you said, validate that we can do this, and then we can apply it to other areas. Well, so I want and to get my, other... yeah, my concern about the I should, never mind. I should be quiet. Go ahead. No, that's all right. I just I wanted to get other input and see what oh, other please, people yeah. think about that of of these two options. Listen, I you know, okay. Well, let me try to summarize what I think may be a consensus position here. Um, certainly, I introduced the thumb trick and the wrist rotation trick, but now I'm going to um, suggest a possible sweet spot. We're going to take a standard enable hand, and we're going to commit to a standard enable hand because that addresses Mark's appropriate concern, which is we're in the enable hand business. We've got lots of people who need it. Let's not go for a specialized hand. In order to do that, we are going to make, and you should pardon the expression, a test harness, <laughs> which is a custom gauntlet for trouble. And that's just meant to fit around his the fact that he has a hand, although it's it's a it's it's an oddball hand. So we're gonna have a standard cyborg beast on a custom gauntlet whose job it is to turn Peregrine's forearm into the typical case. Then, then we can do two things. I'm going to introduce a new idea, which is he then becomes a good candidate for a robo arm, which uses his perfectly good elbow mo motion in order to cause the hand to grip. That's not for this group to do, but it's something that I'm now suddenly interested in doing because I think it makes sense. Secondly, we can add on to it the power assist, which is what Adam is saying. Thirdly, at that point, we're in a really good position to say, is wrist rotation actually something he needs? If it is, great. 
And fourthly, if we get there, then we can work on the fancy thumb rotation, but I think that's fourth in line. So I've just sort of proposed a way of proceeding which whose very first point is to accommodate Mark. Mark, it's going to be a standard cyborg hand on what to the hand feels like a standard gauntlet. Which is what Adam is saying. That's correct. At that point... Uh, Artie, we're getting some feedback from you, if you would mind muting, please. Uh, I, if that was clear, I'm finished. <laughs> okay. My, I guess, yeah, my, my big question is is this now. Are we, are we going to use the sensors in the form, or are we going to use the sensors with Trouble's fingers? I think that's TBD, and I think that's... I think it's frankly irrelevant to the rest of the design process. I mean, basically, for the design process, we're using RoboHand and we're using motors. That's like the front end of it. And then the back end of it is there's some sensors. And for some patients, we may end up using finger sensors. For some patients, we may use uh, EMG. For some, use, maybe we use uh, Mechanomile. But that, when you, when you look at the way systems like this work, basically, your sensors are isolated from everything else. You've got a microprocessor that says, I'm going to do this based on the incoming information. And so what the incoming information is becomes irrelevant. Well, not irrelevant, but... I guess that, that's where I was most confused about. I, I got that we were going to use a cyborg handle like that and make a kind of customized gauntlet. I was just very confused about using the sensors in the finger because not many people in our cases have fingers that they can use for sensor-wise or if we're going to use the forearm sensors. And that's kind of what I was trying to... I guess I was trying to figure that part out earlier. So I want to... Uh, sorry, jumping in here. I want to try to clarify one thing. We are coming up on our time, so I'm going to try to wrap things up here and we can continue. I think our next discussion is going to be more of, a, of an R&D hangout to really start to get into this stuff. But uh, for now, I heard John say that we want to start with a standard enable hand. It's already proven, etc. But then he went on to say that Trouble would be a really good case to focus on and that he's a good candidate for the robot arm design. So let's clarify that. Are we suggesting that we start with a standard enable hand and modify that, or are we saying that we start with a robo arm, test that in its current form, and then work on augmenting that design? My suggestion is step one is a custom gauntlet that will present our standard interface to a standard beast hand. That's step one. Secondly, two things happen. We look at elbow power, and we look at motor power. Those are two parallel and compatible processes, and then we get to, com to compare them. Then... I, I like John's idea. Okay. You can say that, you know, you can then elaborate. But I the like your idea, John. The first few steps are, are clear. Excellent. Okay, so I've got step one. We would use a standard enable hand with a custom gauntlet for trouble. We would then move on to considering a robo arm or other arm activated design and uh, prove that out. We would then consider adding some type of powered activation and or sensors if that would improve it. And we those can then two, specifically. Uh, Jeremy, I'm design. sorry. Those two can and should happen in parallel. I'm not suggesting that the myoelectric enthusiasts have to wait for elbow power. I'm gotcha. saying elbow power can 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 be in a contest with myo with with um, uh, mechan with electric power. John, I think what you say makes a lot of sense. Okay, I think that's probably a good point to then start to wrap today's conversation. Uh, it gives me enough material that I can go and at least take a stab on making some modifications to the project plan, and I'll, I'll try to capture everything we talked about, and I'll reorganize the notes here a little bit. Um, obviously, we can always continue these just ad hoc discussions as we have been through G Plus and, and, and anything else. Uh, I think, as I said, the next step is probably going to be more of an R&D type hangout where we get into more of a brainstorming about how to move forward on some of these ideas and start to uh, solidify the plans and, and action items from there. So I will work to put that together. Um, I'll probably, unless anyone suggests otherwise, I'll, I'll, I'll try to stick with the same day and time as that seems to work for most folks. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll try to sort of, as I revisit the project plan, I'm, I'm probably going to end up changing the timeline a bit. I, I think we can probably do this in, in somewhat lesser time even than what we were originally looking at, but I'll put something out there and then get input from everyone. We can adjust from there. So uh, 
Jeremy, I, real quick, if we're gonna if we're gonna break into the subgroups, I'd suggest we establish a third subgroup based on this discussion of of basically clinical, which is uh, patient patient focused elements. Um, so that'll be socket and, and patient interaction. So when you're when you're building up your three teams, um, and that'll I think that'll probably finish up the rest of the uh, of the people engaged. Excellent. Okay, I, I will capture that in here, and and thanks for volunteering for those focus areas, Adam. What what what? <laughs> No, we'll, we'll find somebody who can help there, but obviously I would love your, your help. Um, okay, good, good. Jeremy? Yeah, Bob. Jeremy, thanks for, thank you for everything. Another fantastic. <laughs> he's breaking up, but he's saying nothing but good things about you, Jeremy. Yes, I, agree. I can't hear you. <laughs> that was your compliment. Thanks, Bob. Good <laughs> job, by the way. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for whatever it is. <laughs> uh, happy to help, and and this is you know this is a team effort. Second one in a row. Me. You were. <laughs> we'll have to work on that connection for next time, Bob. Yeah, All actually, right, folks, right. I'm going to wrap here. I am going to uh, put together uh, an updated uh, sort of plan, and I'll share that with everyone. As an FYI, all files related to this effort are going into a single directory. If you could help me with that, it's under the Enable Shared folder, under Research and Development, under Myoelectric Prosthesis. And I might rename that to you know, something more appropriate given our discussion here, but uh, that's the one place where we'll be putting all these files. And anyone feel free to jump in there and help out. Anyone else have anything before we wrap? Um, I'll go ahead and put all yeah. the sidebar chat into a document like I do every time, and I'll try to put it in that. What are going to say? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and take us off broadcast now. If you guys, any you want to hang out, we can still talk.